Hi there, this is your moderator, Lori Dearman, and you are in the right place for How Active Rehab Protocols Reduce Post-Operative Recovery Time. I'd like to extend a warm welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar sponsored by DJO and the West Coast Sports Medicine Foundation, who will be providing the CEU credits for today. Also hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. In just a moment, I'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they reveal a pre- and post-operative protocol that incorporates NMES with active rehabilitation to enable faster functional recovery from injuries and surgeries. Joining us today, we have a diverse audience of professionals across the globe, all interested in best practices to initiate active rehabilitation protocols preoperatively to reduce postoperative recovery time, the importance of rebuilding muscle strength and pre- and postoperatively using bilateral and or co-contraction treatment method, and also how athletic patients recover faster and get back to competition. Now, before today's webinar, we asked each of you to tell us a bit about what you would like to learn today, and many of you weighed in. I'd like to thank each of you for your input, and I think you'll find that our speakers will address your requests throughout the program. That does bring us to our first poll for today, and folks, coming up on your screen, there is a question. We'd like to hear from each of you. What are your biggest challenges following a successful surgery? Is it when to rehabilitate, I'm sorry, when to initiate rehabilitation program, progress of the rehab program, and I'm going to ask you to select your top two here, and this is on the honor system, so top two, um, preventing pre-op muscle weakness, building strength, or return to sport or activity. So give it some thought and let us know what your top two biggest challenges are following a successful surgery. Uh, 22% of you saying when to initiate rehabilitation program, 54 progress of the rehab program, 29% saying preventing pre-op muscle weakness, 26% saying building strength, and maybe it's not a surprise, 54% saying return to sports or activity. So thank you so much for your input. I know it will be helpful for our speakers as they go through their content today. Today we have Keith S. Fetter, MD, board certified, fellowship trained sports medicine, orthopedic surgeon, and assistant clinical professor at UCLA School of Medicine. For more than 20 years, Dr. Fader has been a team physician and chief orthopedic consultant for professional sports teams, collegiate sports organizations, as well as USA Volleyball, USA Weightlifting, and the Association of Volleyball Professionals. Dr. Fader is an active elite level athlete and continues to compete and has been a world champion in men's masters basketball. Dr. Fader, it's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, thank you, Lori, and thank you for inviting me to speak on uh, one of my favorite subjects. Um, good morning to the West Coast and uh, good afternoon to the East Coast. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, provide a lot of useful information going forward. And let's get started. All right, uh, folks, Dr. Fader will get us started talking about NMES and its applications in sports medicine. Jim Briskowitz will be speaking just after Dr. Fader about the application of NMES to enhance athletic performance and recovery. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Fader. Uh, thank you again, Lori. Uh, let's start by giving an overview and a definition of what NMES is. It's neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation is the elicitation of muscle contraction using electrical impulses. The impulses are generated by a device and delivered through electrodes on the skin in proximity to the muscle to be stimulated. The impulses mimic the actual action potential coming from the central nervous system that causes the muscles to contract. I want to at this point, contrast that to something that uh, everybody in the audience is very familiar with, and that's called TENS, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Well, what NMES isn't, it is not TENS. TENS is a technique used to uh, reduce pain in an injured part of the body uh, by electrodes applied to the skin, delivering intermittent stimulation of surface nerves and blocking the transmission of pain. TENS is, is used 
very, very often and uh, for uh, both pre and post operatively to reduce pain and allow patients to comfortably engage in appropriate treatment. But remember, electrical impulses generated by TENS devices do not cause muscle tissue to fire, do not cause muscle tissue to hypertrophy, and do not recruit muscle fibers. So we're going to put TENS aside and we're going to really focus on NMES for this talk. How does NMES work? Well, NMES has a muscle fiber effect and there's been uh, ongoing and significant research showing exactly how the NMES works. There are multiple levels of uh, NMES application. Uh, 10 to 20 hertz stimulates type 1 slow twitch. 5 to 50 to 70 hertz stimulate type 2 a intermediate fast twitch. And 75 to 130 stimulates type 2B dedicated fast twitch motor units. In, in the clinical setting, we really uh, most significantly use the uh, interval between 50 and 100 hertz. The 50 to 100 hertz application really is best for building muscle girth and muscle strength. And that's where we focus in our clinical application. Uh, how is NMES used? Uh, rehabilitation and atrophy prevention for partially or totally immobilized patients. It's a testing tool uh, for, neuro for neuromuscular uh, and muscular uh, uh, performance, a strength training tool for active, healthy individuals and athletes, and a post-exercise recovery tool for, for athletes as well. One important thing to note with NMES, one of the key components of NMES is active recovery, and that allows us to train at a higher level and a higher intensity level uh, going forward. Now here we have two, uh, two areas, and we're going to be, I am going to be um, focusing on the pre and post-op rehab, and Jim Bruskowitz will be speaking later, we'll talk more about performance and recovery. However, just an overview. Uh, in the rehab, prehab area of uh, utilization of NMES, we use it to reduce and or, pre and or prevent disuse atrophy. We want to use it to reduce um, uh, swelling and effusion and maintain and hopefully increase the range of motion of the in injured joint or operated joint. It's, it's also useful for muscle re education and relax relaxation of muscle tissue when we use the NMES massage setting. Um, we also utilize it to increase local blood circulation. Now, specifically, I'm very happy with uh, the MP Elite that has the uh, massage setting for the NMES, and that really um, allows us to reduce the swelling, inflammation, and effusion. And I've seen that clinically uh, on a repetitive basis. Now, with performance and recovery, which we'll talk about a little later, uh, NMES is intended to stimulate healthy tissue in order to perform, improve and facilitate uh, sports performance. Remember, it's only used by adults only and is considered a technique of muscle training. Just a little bit of an overview of the history of NMES. Believe it or not, it started back in uh, 1791. Luigi Galvani first found scientific evidence that an electric current can actually activate muscle tissue. Uh, jumping ahead to the 60s, where we really heard much more about NMES. It was used by the Soviet bloc in Eastern European countries. Uh, their sports scientists uh, applied NMES in training for elite athletes. Um, and they actually claimed a 40% in increase in muscle uh, development utilizing NMES. Jumping again forward in the 70s and 80s, Bruce Lee uh, popularized uh, galvanic exercise to accelerate his personal MMA training. Uh, and then in the 80s and 90s and, and up to the present, we're really uh, accessing the NMES in a much more uh, widespread fashion, uh, both in the prehab, rehab, and uh, sports performance areas. So we're going to go over all those uh, topics and uh, hopefully uh, move forward from there.
I just want to give a little overview at this point about the clinical research uh, and the, and the peer-reviewed peer, peer studies that have shown that NMES uh, is effective uh, uh, in the clinical setting. Uh, but first, I want to talk about uh, our, our primary area of focus today. We're going to talk about ACL injury, ACL surgery, and the post-op application, pre-op and post-op application of NMES in our protocol. Uh, ACLs are very well known, of course. It's a very common injury, uh, unfortunately, in, the, in this day and age. Approximately 200,000 ACL injuries occur per year. 50% of ACL injuries occur in the 15 to 25 year old age group, which are the active uh, athletic uh, population. 68% uh, of ACL injuries are non-contact injuries, and women, unfortunately, are two to ten times more likely to injure the ACL. Now, why, the, why is that? Well, we've been doing a lot of research in that area over the last 10 to 15 years, and it is most significantly in the, in the female population that they tend to be quad dominant with weaker glutes and hams. Uh, females tend to land with a knee at or near full extension. That puts them in a very uh, precarious situation for injury. Uh, females tend to land with weight uh, predominantly on one leg. And on landing, females tend to uh, have their knee buckle inwards. All, all of these factors predispose the female uh, in a dynamic sense to be at a higher risk for uh, ACL injury. Now, what is being done about that? Well, NMES really plays a big role in that area because we're really focused in ACL prevention protocols in um, preferentially strengthening glutes and hams in the, in the female and teaching them how to land, how to cut and uh, increasing their core strength and hip strength as well to decrease the incidence of ACL injury. And NMES is used uh, very aggressively in that area, and Jim will talk about that later in, the, in this uh, presentation. Now, once we've, we've actually carried out ACL surgery, once we've actually brought the patient back to uh, return to sport level, there's unfortunately a re-injury level. The re-injury rate for ACL reconstructed knee is up to 5 to 10 percent, depending upon the uh, type of graft used. Um, the risk of ACL injury in the contralateral knee following a reconstruction is double that of the, uh, of the reconstructed knee. Uh, only one-third of reconstructed athletes actually attempt to play competitive sports at their pre-injury level within the first year following reconstruction. One in five active reconstruction, um, reconstructed athletes do unfortunately develop a new injury. Fear of re-injury actually uh, has prevented 30% of college and, college and high school football players from returning to play, and 20%, 7% did not return, uh, did return but not at the same level of play. So the take home from this particular slide is really maximizing uh, the rehab, maximizing the uh, lower extremity strength and core strength to reduce re-injury and to increase sports performance. Just to review some of the uh, research specifically on utilization of NMES uh, on post-op patients, the, one of the early uh, papers was by Lynn Snyder Mackler in 1995, 110 ACL patients. Uh, she looked at uh, NMES and quad strength, and the, there was she found significant improvement uh, postoperatively with utilization of NMES with the with the rehab program. She found 70% recovery of quad strength with NMES, high intensity NMES, versus only 51% recovery of quad strength without NMES uh, at the six week postop period which is uh, quite uh, significant. Other uh, important articles 
uh, and peer-reviewed uh, studies included uh, Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy in September 2003. Uh, the patients in reported a, a, an increase in knee function at 12 and 6 weeks post-op versus uh, subjects without NMES. Uh, in the uh, Journal of Knee Surgery, July 2008, um, the findings were that NMES should be instituted early in the post-op period and be of high intensity to be effective and, and achieve meaningful, meaningful results. Uh, July 2010, Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy found NMES when combined with exercise to be more effective in, in improving quad strength than exercise alone. And uh, a specific uh, study carried out in 2013 which was the effective neuromuscular electrical stimulation on quad strength and, and knee function in professional soccer players following ACL reconstruction. Was very significant in that uh, quad, quad strength increased with NMES 28.7% uh, and without NMES 4.6%. Uh, almost a sevenfold improvement versus with NMES versus without NMES in, the pro, in a pro soccer uh, population. The next, this slide is just to let you know that NMES is not only for athletes. It's been found to be very, very effective in both prehab and post and post-op uh, tonal knee replacement patients. Um, walls in 2010 using NMES in 14 uh, pre-op total knee patients found significant improvement in strength, function, and subjective outcomes. It was found that in this paper that NMES expedites return to normal activities and NMES utilization, which is very significant, was 97% plus. So very patient compliant very patient friendly and uh, found to be uh, significantly significantly uh, improved utilizing NMES. Just one uh, post-op uh, total knee replacement uh, study uh, done by Stevens and Lapsky, uh, Physical Therapy 2012, 66 uh, post-op total knee patients utilizing NMES and measuring uh, multiple uh, areas two times a day, five to six days a week. Found significant strength, functional, and subject improvements in the NMES group. There were meaningful differences not, not only at the six-week post-op mark, but lasting improvement up to 52 weeks post-op. And it was found to return to pre-surgical performance levels faster with NMES groups across all measures in that study. So overall, NMES can be applied to both the young athlete, the middle-aged athlete, the, uh, as well as the older group uh, following pre, pre and, pre and post-total uh, knee replacement. So let's look at the uh, prehabilitation protocol for ACL patients. Uh, the overview, as everyone knows, the vast majority of ACL uh, injuries comes with a significant swelling, inflammation, and infusion. The number one priority in the pre-op phase of ACL reconstruction is reducing swelling, inflammation, and restoring the full range of motion of the knee. We want to increase the uh, patient to full weight bearing is tolerated and less is a multi-ligament injury, uh, which, we, which we want to protect. We want to maintain muscle strength and prevent atrophy in that prehab area of uh, focus to allow us to get a better post-operative result. And we want to implement NMES early. Now, just a short overview on NMES itself. Uh, NMES has, must be a minimum of 50 hertz, as I mentioned earlier, to build muscle or maintain muscle. 
we like to see a symmetrical square biphasic asynchronous waveform. And what that only means, as opposed to a straight Russian type stim program using uh, symmetrical square biphasic asynchronous waveforms allow us to uh, train at a higher intensity and and, a com and, 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 and it is comfortable for the patient. Um, we want to have an NMES unit that's both bilateral and has co-contraction capabilities. We want an NMES unit that is an individual channel adjustment. And just to be uh, clear, almost most of the older uh, research was done uh, with non-portable units because at the time the intensity uh, was not uh, attainable in portable units. With the with the with the rapid increase in the technology in portable units, they are equal at this point, and a portable unit is uh, is good to go with these type of protocols. Here's just a, a short overview of uh, a pre-op ACL reconstruction protocol. Uh, usually, it is between uh, 10 and 20 days following the. Uh, ACL injury and diagnosis that we can move forward with surgical intervention. One thing to remember in all types of strength training, it should be a split routine. When that means is focusing on quads and hams on one day and glutes on uh, the following day. We don't want to train the same muscle groups on consecutive days. We must have recovery. We must have recovery to build muscle and maintain, maintain strength and increase strength. Here we're just showing um, NMES utilized with both quad sets and straight leg raises, which is what we, we initiate immediately, almost immediately after a, an ACL uh, injury diagnosis uh, to, uh, to at least maintain uh, muscle girth and strength and uh, prevent the disuse atrophy. So as soon as we uh, obtain the goals that we set out in the uh, <clears throat> pre-op phase of, uh, of ACL injury, which is uh, reducing the uh, swelling, inflammation, and infusion, restoring full range of motion of at least 0 to 125 degrees, and maintaining the, uh, the strength and, and reducing or eliminating the disuse atrophy, we move forward to the surgical intervention. The gold standard of uh, ACL <coughs> reconstruction is arthroscopic. It is uh, utilization of a bone, tendon, bone, patella tendon autograft. Um, and uh, this slide just brings us through the progression of the surgery. In the top left here and in the top right are two examples of full thickness. ACL tears in two different patients. And simply, at the time of surgical intervention, we initially will, uh, will uh, evaluate the patient for meniscal injury, for chondral injury. Those will be treated either with partial meniscectomy or meniscal repair, as well as chondroplasty in the appropriate uh, circumstance. We then remove the uh, remnant of the anterior cruciate ligament. We then carry out a lateral and roof notch plasty, um, and then move forward with the uh, with the uh, tibial tunnel, utilizing a a, a three thirty second guide wire, uh, and creating the tibial tunnel. And then, uh, in the last five years, we've gone to a more anatomic uh, femoral femoral tunnel, which in a right knee is at the ten thirty position here in this slide and in a left knee we position it at the 230 position to give a more anatomic position of the uh, ACL graft. Uh, here we have uh, the uh, patella tendon autograph uh, placed in an anatomic position and uh, finally we place a, a biocompatible interference screw to create an in interference fit. Um, in my practice, I do my, the majority of my ACL reconstructions are with uh, patella tendon autographs. We do use rigid fixation, 
which gives us greater confidence in the post -op, early post-op period to get the patient started on a more aggressive uh, rehab program. So once we've uh, completed the ACL reconstruction, we immediately start the post-op rehab. Um, it's most important in the early post-op period to obtain full passive knee extension immediately following the surgery, obtain full passive patellar mobility to restore the flexion uh, in a gradual fashion, reduce post-op pain, inflammation, and swelling with NMES and modalities to allow the rehab progression. Um, one note here is I like using an MP, the MP Phoenix because it does have a TENS protocol within it in the early post-op period to uh, control the pain as well as uh, implement the NMES. We then want to restore neuromuscular, uh, neuromuscular uh, control, voluntary quad control with the NMES and proprioceptive training. We want to gradually increase the load to full weight bearing as tolerated in the early post-op period. Gradually increase applied loads to, into both double and single leg uh, to increase strength and girth, progress to sports specific activities and return to play. Specifically, uh, our phase one protocol is zero to two weeks, obtain, maintain full, full knee extension, reduce the post-op pain, inflammation and swelling. We utilize a long leg hinge brace to maintain extension and protect the reconstruction. We, start, we, we immediately uh, implement the NMES to restore neuromuscular control and voluntary quad control. We want to, as uh, mentioned in the last slide, increase the load to full weight bearing as tolerated. Uh, begin quad sets and straight leg raises immediately following surgery. Actually, the night of surgery, we implement the NMES with quad sets and straight leg raises as well as, as ankle pumps. And then hopefully by 10 days to 14 days, we have the patient to 110 degrees of flexion. We get them on the stationary bike and get the cardio, uh, restoring the cardio. Here we're just showing uh, several uh, areas of NMES application on the hamstrings, on the quads for co-contraction, and on the uh, lower leg uh, with ankle circles. NMES really uh, is an excellent application here, getting the muscles uh, to fire in that early post-op period when there is still pain and inflammation, and it's very effective. Moving on to phase two, uh, we want to maintain um, range of motion and uh, especially in extension. Extension is the most important thing in the early post-op period. We want to restore flexion. We want to get them at least by two to three weeks at the, at le at the worst, get them on the stationary bike. We want to start the wall squats with NMES, double leg press, progressing the single leg press with NMES. You can see in the photos on the right, we're doing standing calf raises with NMES. We can also do calf raises on the leg press machine. And we are starting step ups and weight shifts with and without the NMES. Here we're just showing uh, some additional uh, electrode placements. On the left is for the glutes. We like to use the uh, NMES on the, on the glutes with weight shift, with single leg stance with wall squats uh, to uh, enhance the muscle firing and muscle recruitment. Uh, Co-contraction um, also is applied with the NMES, the VMO on hamstrings, and these are the uh, pad placements we like for that application. Once we get to phase three, we're really moving more towards uh, an, an, more towards and advancing the uh, protocol Six to 12 weeks is phase three, increasing strength, increasing proprioception, uh, improve endurance, improve limb confidence. We want to implement more single leg exercise. You can see on the right, we're doing single leg leg presses and single leg uh, split squats. The split squat uh, on the upper right is really one of my most favorite exercises. 
because it does incorporate uh, multiple areas. We get the glutes, we get the hamstrings, we get the quads, and we do get the core and hip activated as well. This is an excellent uh, exercise to really re-educate the whole ex lower extremity and get the uh, core activated as well. Also in, the six to two, in this phase three, we like to get the patient on the uh, stair stepper, get them on the elliptical. We, we begin pool running, balance training, uh, and really at this point, really are moving forward fairly rapidly in the rehab depending upon uh, the patient's uh, response. Uh, progression in this phase is really dependent upon uh, controlling and eliminating uh, pain, inflammation, and swelling. Uh, around the knee and the lower extremity. Now, uh, here we have a couple other pictures uh, showing the split squat um, and a lunge. Here we like, in, towards the end of phase three, we like to start uh, loading uh, the single leg exercises with weight. And you can see here on the left, uh, the athlete is holding two dumbbells doing a, a lunge and uh, on the right uh, doing the split squat, which we also uh, will begin loading uh, with uh, weight resistance. Phase four is actually my favorite phase of the rehab program because we're actually transitioning uh, the patient to an athlete. Uh, once the first 12 weeks or three months has elapsed, uh, we, in the vast majority, have completely controlled pain, inflammation, and swelling, and we're really focusing on returning this patient to being an athlete, to being able to uh, engage in higher level activity and moving them towards return to play. So in phase four, we want to increase leg strength to normal, enhance neuromuscular control, improve muscular power and endurance and perform uh, sport and begin to perform sport specific movements and drills, increase single leg exercise and loading uh, in combination with NMES. We start them on a running a ramp up protocol beginning with walking, jogging and running, only straight uh, either on a treadmill or a track. Towards the end of this uh, phase we start doing cone drills, side shuffles, karaoke's uh, and sudden start stops. Uh, and as well, at, towards the end of this phase, we start plyo box jump ups with NMES. We start kettlebell training, continue pool running, balance training uh, at this point. Now, another, another important point at this phase. The first, for phase one, two, and three, we're really, my protocol, we use the MP Elite, but at phase four, we like to switch over to the Compex. The Compex is a more complete uh, NMES unit. It has resistance, strength, and explosive strength settings in addition to my favorite setting, which is active recovery. In phase four, we're increasing intensity, duration, and frequency of training uh, for the patient, and we need active recovery. Jim's going to talk specifically about how active recovery works, but I personally use active recovery almost on a daily basis. And after every workout I do, uh, it allows, me, allows my muscles to recover uh, at a much uh, higher uh, rate and level and allows me to come back the next day and, and do other types of activities and training. So phase five, this is where we really get uh, aggressive with the, uh, with the patient and athlete to get them back to uh, unrestricted sports. Phase five is uh, from four to six months. There's a gradual return to un full unrestricted sports, maximize leg strength and endurance. And here is where we really implement explosive training with NMES. And what explosive training is, it's number one, squats, number two, cleans, clean poles and jump training. My personal experience uh, and with my and my clinical experience is squats 
is probably the best exercise uh, for return to play and for lower extremity injuries. Uh, again, it engages the glutes, hams, um, and quads. It thoroughly engages and, in, and strengthens the core, and it's a key exercise for return to sport. We want to additionally continue to build limb confidence and proprioception, perform sport-specific movements and drills, and really progress sports skill level to return to play. Now, what's our then, once we've gotten to the five to six month uh, time frame of following ACA reconstruction, what are uh, the, what is the criteria for return to unrestricted play? Well, it's a given that the patient has no knee effusion and full range of motion, but we want to have less than one centimeter of quad atrophy. We want to have a KT-1000 that's less than three millimeters side to side different that proves to us that the knee is stable, and we want the patient to have no sensation of instability. At that point, we can consider returning the patient to uh, full full activity and unrestricted play. You see in the pro sports area, a per, there are there's certainly a uh, an interval between which uh, athletes return to full play, and that can be six months to a year, depending upon the progress in the post-op period, the progress uh, with the training, and really the confidence that the patient has with the reconstructed lower extremity to move forward with uh, unrestricted play. And that obviously varies from athlete to athlete. So at this point, uh, I think we've gotten a pretty good overview of the uh, pre, pre and post-op uh, rehabilitation program uh, for AC reconstruction utilizing NMES. And I want to turn this over, turn this back to Lori and Jim, and Jim can go forward with his uh, presentation on performance and recovery. Well, thank you, Dr. Fader, and don't go too far. We'll be having you back at the end for the Q&A. And um, folks, speaking next, we do have Jim Bruskowitz, Clinical Education Specialist, former lecturer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Department of Kinesiology, with concentrations in exercise physiology, biomechanics, and physiology principles of training. Jim is a two-time world triathlon age sorry, a two-time world triathlon age group champion and placed second in his age group in the Ironman World Champions Kona. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you today? I'm doing great, Laurie. Thanks for, thanks for uh, including me in this. Excited. Well, it's a pleasure and uh, at this point I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Dr. Feeder. That was a great presentation. I very much enjoyed that. And I'm excited about your pre and post uh, rehab protocol because you are using NMES. And uh, that device that you use has two strength building programs and a recovery program. So for people that find themselves in the situation of having been injured, um, that device is able to deliver not only a, a good recovery program, but also does a great job of uh, building strength and training muscle that's, that's not really healthy at this point because of the injury. But I know that after they get through um, a program such as yours that the athletes will be back in the game more quickly if they're using NMES in conjunction with uh, the other protocol that you have. Um, moving forward with training for a healthy athlete after 12 to 16 weeks of building specific adaptations, NMES again can take its place as an effective training tool to take athletes beyond their former adaptive ceilings and it's very good for that because when we voluntarily try to contract muscle there is a limit to how much we can recruit synchronously we can push through that with NMES and that really is is one of the um, most powerful features and characteristics of incorporating NMES training um, into either a, a prehab, posthab, or a training program for a healthy athlete who's trying to perform better. 
There are many over-the-counter NMES devices to be consistent with Dr. Fader's protocol. I'll speak about the Compex Sport Elite that he uses and he's adopted um, NMES, I know, for a number of years and, and has benefited from its use. Um, this NMES device for improving healthy muscle function has a broader range of frequencies. It has more programs with longer strength building segments and, and it also has a way to fine tune an athlete's performance because you can select a program to target the muscle fiber type of your choice or the athlete's choice. Got ahead of myself there. Um, the frequencies that you see in this slide are delivered as short twitches, not tetanic contractions, so they will not further fatigue a muscle. This is Dr. Fader's uh, favorite program on the NMES unit that he has, and um, it delivers these different frequencies sequentially. It spends a couple of minutes at each frequency and is about a 24 minute program. Um, when running this program, the load on the joints is minimal. There's no appreciable cardiovascular load and although the muscles are actively recovering, there's no mental fatigue associated with the stimulation. If you look at the block of 9, 8, and 7 hertz, according to Broderick et al. in the article, Hemodynamic Performance of Neuromuscular Electrical Stimulation During Recovery from a Total Hip Arthroplasty, uh, they found that the blood flow was increased up to 600% using NMES at these frequencies. Uh, Narek et al. in a study that compared swim recovery and muscle stimulation on lactate removal after sprint swimming measured 25% reduction in lactate levels after administering active recovery frequencies to athletes having sprinted during swimming competitions. Warren et al. did an interesting study um, that's reported in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. He found that pitching speeds were significantly higher from inning to inning when complex active recovery programs were administered to the pitchers between those innings. According to Kitchen, who authored Electrotherapy Evidence-Based Practice, an analgesic effect from endorphin production along with increased blood flow occurs in that four to six hertz range. The result from that is that the muscle feels light and ready for more activity. In the one to eight hertz range and particularly at the one hertz level, um, it has a relaxing effect on the muscles and helps blood flow post active recovery according to Snyder Mackler's clinical electrophysiology, electrotherapy and electrophysiologic testing. So to summarize this program, it really, uh, active recovery has three prongs to it being increased blood flow, endorphin generation and relaxation of the muscle. You can see in this slide that there are uh, a number of different athletes all doing active recovery. Uh, some of them are multitasking, that's one of the nice things about it besides the fact that there's no mental fatigue or load on the joints. Um, and you can also notice that you can use it on any, any muscle group that you like, any skeletal muscle. This is a slide that Dr. Fader presented already, but I wanted to present it again because the Compex Elite that is his NMES device of choice offers more frequencies than does uh, the NMES unit that he uses in his prehab and posthab. Uh, the 10 to 20 hertz stimulates type 1 slow twitch motor units. Um, these muscle fibers are well adapted for aerobic energy delivery and the energy delivery system for endurance activities. If one selects the program that will stimulate the type 2 muscle fibers best trained between the 50 and 70 hertz. Um, then one is training the most prevalent muscle fiber type in an average individual. The fiber can deliver energy aerobically and anaerobically, so sports like soccer where the rate of energy delivery is constantly changing places a high demand on this muscle fiber type. The highest of the frequencies, 75 and 130 hertz, trains the type 2B muscle fibers. 
Um, and these muscle fibers are well adapted to delivering energy at very high rates for up to about a minute. At that point, the amount of lactic acid that's produced starts to inhibit uh, more energy delivery. Football players rely heavily on this muscle fiber type. So an individual that's moving forward and trying to really improve their performance can pinpoint by selecting a particular program what muscle fiber type they want to train um, so they can address specifically uh, their needs in this particular sport they're involved with. They might want to specifically address that area where they feel they have shortcomings and at least at, at least gain full adaptation of the muscle fiber types that they have. Uh, <clears throat> this NMES strength training study um, looked at electrostimulation while performing plyometric exercises. Um, the take-home message um, in these key points is, is that the most profound and wide-ranging benefits regarding improving expo you know, explosive, explosive elastic, and explosive elastic reactive jumping comes when the NMES stimulation frequencies are high and combined with plyometro. Uh, plyometry, hopping preceding the jumping um, showed the, the greatest benefit in this particular study. Here we can see the different uh, methods of training that were used in this study. Um, the least effective routines are represented in figures 2A and 2E. Um, it should be noted that a higher level of stimulation achieved by increasing the milliamps delivered or the amount of energy that's delivered is more comfortably tolerated when the NMES contractions and voluntary contractions coincide. So not only are they able to recruit more muscle when they're performing the exercises, but because of that, the results are better when they're able to do it. Um, there are a number of studies on NMES strength training and the benefits that uh, accrued from it. Um, vertical leap improvements of 14% on average were reported in the International Journal of Sports by Mel Fuetti. And that was in a study done with basketball players. Uh, Brocheri et al. reported medicine and science and sports exercise of 5% improvement in short sprinting times of hockey players after just three weeks of NMES training. Three weeks of training is the amount of time needed to clearly demonstrate significant force production gains. Um, as I mentioned before, NMES, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, is fantastic at being able to recruit muscle fibers, and it does a better job of that than can be accomplished with a maximal voluntary contraction. That really opens the door for increasing strength strength is, for the most part, a function of how many motor units, how many muscle fibers you can recruit synchronously, and NMES is a great tool for that. Um, of the studies reviewed by Filipovic, 27 demonstrated significant gains in strength, power, and or in endurance. Um, what we have here is a suggested five-week training plan using different programs from the Compex Sport Elite. Um, and these different programs are running at different frequencies. So this is kind of a mixed phase of training right here, strength training um, in the 75 to 100 hertz, endurance training in the 10 to 20 hertz. Um, the most widely used and straightforward approach to developing a training plan using NMES is to apply familiar weight training principles. Those principles have been applied in this five-week complex sport elite training program, and you see um, that you can see here those principles are to train a muscle group at most, as Dr. Fader mentioned, at most every other day to allow for recovery. Each muscle group trained can be in its own 
can be on its own schedule. Dr. Feener also mentioned that um, he utilizes a split routine. Um, so you might have a certain muscle group or set of muscle groups on day one, three, five, and a different set of muscle groups on two, four, and six or seven. Um, it's important with NMES to engage as much muscle as possible by finding the athlete's threshold of tolerance while running a complex NMES program. You cannot really suggest a particular level, uh, an energy level that one should run a program at because different individuals have different amounts of neural inhibition depending on how well trained they are and some other factors as well. And also there's a fair amount of uh, bilateral inequality in the amount of neural inhibition. We have dominant sides um, and those will not take as much stimulation in order to get a certain level of contraction. Complex training can be done isometrically or dynamically. We've seen that when done dynamically, the greatest gains will be found. Um, training isometrically when compared with traditional strength training still yields greater gains. Um, the isometric training can be done uh, while seated, standing, supine, or prone, depending on the muscle group that's trained. The position that people put themselves in while they're doing this training is really a matter of how much contraction can they get with the greatest amount of comfort. Dynamic training is done simultaneously while engaged in voluntary training so that the contraction that's involuntary from the NMES device and the voluntary contractions match up. Um, you can use any of the recovery programs as Dr. Fader does on any day and on any muscle group as needed. He mentioned that he does it daily. Uh, a great approach to improving recovery is to do multiple sessions on a, muscle, uh, on a particular muscle group. So once the pads are placed and the unit is hooked up, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong and actually there's a, lot that's, that's, there's a lot right about running more than one program at a time. With a warm-up, uh, a training session, the slide lasts 27 minutes when you see a resistance program listed. Um, the strength programs are approximately 43 minutes. They vary a little bit depending on the level that you choose. And the endurance program with warm-up is about 55 minutes long. A muscle group should be trained for at least three weeks. It's going to take three weeks before you're going to see statistically significant increases in force production. And it's even more beneficial if that training is extended like it is here up to five weeks. Anything more than six weeks, um, people start to see plateaus in their performance. So the best approach for that is to switch up the training stimulus and that can be done by selecting a different program. You don't have to select a different muscle. Uh, you don't have to select a different muscle group for the training. Uh, here you can see NMES being used while individuals are doing a variety of, of exercises and they're using the pads um, and these programs on a variety of muscle groups. Any skeletal muscle can be trained with NMES. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Fader for some final thoughts that he has. Uh, thanks, Jim. That was great. I really uh, like how you uh, explained uh, scientifically how we use the NMES, and certainly I'm a big believer in it. Um, so final thoughts, just an overview. Uh, NMES combined with post-op pre-op pre active rehab, it's clinically proven to reduce muscle atrophy and accelerate post-op recovery. NMES combined with voluntary exercise is clinically proven. Uh, to allow athletic patients to recover faster for, versus post-op passive rehabilitation. The NMES device has been shown scientifically that it should be at minimum 50 hertz to be effective, and clinical studies suggest 75 hertz is the optimal uh, to achieve uh, increased muscle girth and muscle force, and uh, 120 hertz in, is uh, an application that can be used for larger muscle groups. Active recovery, as Jim and I have both mentioned, uh, is an excellent program uh, to cool down and to allow the uh, muscles to recover. It's actually uh, a twitch, not a, not a contraction, that really gets the lactic acid uh, moving out of the muscle, getting the, um, 
uh, blood flow increased in the muscle and allows the uh, muscle recovery and reduces the post-exercise fatigue. And I can uh, uh, definitely uh, agree, and I've seen that uh, with myself on multiple occasions. Occasionally, I actually will do a split routine on the same day, doing cardio in the morning, and then I'll do active recovery, and then I'll in the, and later in the day, I'll actually do uh, weight training and, again, using active recovery following that. So active recovery is uh, a key uh, component of, the, uh, of a weight training and uh, sports performance protocol. So let's turn it back over to Lori, and I think she has uh, some questions. Uh, and what are the next steps, Lori? Absolutely. And folks, uh, if you want to continue the conversation, some next steps here on the screen, we invite you to review the published clinical studies and outcomes that were reviewed during the presentation today. Also to learn more about NMES and how to apply it in practice, as well as NMES exercise protocol or training programs. Uh, and lastly, we do invite you to speak with an NMES education specialist to discuss a protocol or a recommended training program. I would like to go to some of the questions that we have in our queue. This first question looks like a good one for you, Dr. Fader. Uh, the question is, why do you switch them from using one device to another at 12 to 16 weeks post-op? Well, the, uh, in our protocol, we use the MP Elite in the early post-op period that has, it's simpler to use uh, for the patient. Uh, there's three settings, there's strength, endurance, and massage. Um, and um, early in the post-op period, we're not challenging the tissue as much as we will when we get to uh, phase four, which is at 12 to 16 um, a week phase. At the 12 to 16 week phase, I, as I suggested earlier, we're really over surgical intervention. The tissue has become more healthy. It's not completely healthy, but it's more healthy, and we're going to challenge it really more in a sports performance and muscle training uh, fashion than in a rehab fashion. So we like, in my hands and in my office and personally, using that Compex Elite really allows us to dial up the specific uh, application we want. and. Uh, the active recovery in the Compex Elite is a unique program that really uh, is valuable in the recovery and allowing the uh, patient slash athlete to increase the um, intensity, duration, and frequency of their training and getting them back to uh, actual uh, sports participation. Okay, thank you. This next question for you, Jim. Uh, Greg is asking, uh, does muscle fiber recruit beyond 120 hertz? It does. 120 hertz is going to recruit just about all of the all of the different muscle fiber types. Um, the device that Dr. Fader is fond of goes up to 130 hertz, and that uh, really takes care of recruiting all the particularly the large uh, motor units. In one of the studies that I showed uh, that was combining NMES training with plyometric training, their stimulation, they had two stimulation frequencies that they used. One was 185 hertz and the other one was 85 hertz. They found better results at the 185 hertz than they did at the 85 hertz. The reason for that being that the muscle fiber type that they were trying to recruit both voluntarily and involuntarily with the NMES um, are the type 2B fast twitch and they're going to take the highest frequencies in order to stimulate. 85 hertz, which was the other alternative in that study, is not going to get at all of them. It's going to get at a lot of those muscle fiber types, but not all of them. Um, I think the 185 hertz is overshooting what, um, what you need to deliver, but it's not harmful. It's, and it's not really overkill either. It's just a frequency that um, doesn't have to be that high in order to get to get all the muscle fibers that you're looking to, to stimulate. Okay, next question for you, Dr. Fader. Uh, Valerie is asking, with the ACL graft, 
which graft would you recommend to help reduce re-injury? Well, I don't think there's any, that's a good question, but I don't think there's really any uh, solid data. If you'd go autograft, I think in the last, the ACL reconstruction has gone through phases. First, 15 years ago, we were doing almost all autographs. Then, with the advent of better tissue banks and a higher uh, accessibility of allografts, the trend went to more uh, allograft reconstruction, even in the younger patient. Unfortunately, uh, data that came out about three to six years ago was showing a trend towards higher failure rate in allografts, no matter how uh, good the quality of the allograft is, no matter if it was hamstring, uh, posterior tib, anterior tib, patellar tendon, across the board, uh, especially in younger patients, there was a higher failure rate than expected with uh, allograft reconstruction. So the pendulum is now swung back considerably in the under 40 and especially under 35 year old age group who are active and athletic who are going to do cutting, twisting, jumping sports to almost universally use autograft. Now in the autograft side, uh, although I uh, personally do about 90 percent uh, patellar tendons, uh, I think that the um, overall uh, viewpoint from the orthopedic community is that uh, hamstrings and um, and patellar tendons at six months have an equal uh, outcome. Early in the postoperative period, I think that there's a a tilt towards a, a patellar tendon autograft. But the short answer is that definitively, autograft has a lower failure rate um, than allografts in this day and age, and Certainly in that key 15 to 25 year old elite athlete um, portion of the population, injured population, autograft is the way to go. Okay, this question for you, Jim. Uh, Dean is asking, what is the maximum intensity setting for the elite unit, milliamps? It's 120 milliamps uh, for both units for both the MP Elite and the Compex Sport Elite. It's divided up into 999 graded steps, um, which we call energy levels or settings, and uh, but the 120 milliamps is the max that it'll deliver, which is, I must, I must say, it's way more, certainly way, way more than a healthy individual could tolerate. Um, if someone were extremely atrophied, then they're going, they're, there's a great deal of neural inhibition that has to be overcome, and so it, it's great that the, those units have that kind of capability to deliver that level of stimulation, but um, yeah, 120 milliamps. Okay, over to you, Dr. Fader. Uh, Valerie's asking, how soon after can and should you implement an MES? Uh, after a surgical intervention, I assume that's the question. You can really, and we do, implement it actually the day of surgery. We want the patient that, uh, and we use sterile electrodes uh, on the day of surgery, so we apply the electrodes actually in the operating room, and then the sterile dressing goes on that. And uh, as long as we don't put it, uh, the pads directly on the sutures, it's good to go. And we actually... Um, want the patient uh, to uh, implement the NMES uh, the day of surgery at the latest post-op day one because we want to get the um, musculature uh, activated and moving forward. Okay, over to you, Jim. Chris is asking, doesn't the massage setting also stimulate the lymphatic system as well? There have been a few studies that I've read that report that yes, it does, uh, it does enhance lymphatic drainage. Um, I don't have those 
those citations uh, at the top of my head that I could give them, but yes, I have I have read that um, in peer-reviewed studies. And let me add to that, Jim. I think just clinically we've seen we like using the massage setting early uh, post-op also because it does seem to mobilize, uh, you know, the edema and the effusion that everyone gets post-operatively. We like to implement that early, and we've seen a lot of good results with the massage. Okay, and then over to you, Dr. Fader. Uh, Sherry's asking, can I translate this into a protocol for an Achilles tendon rupture in a dancer? Well, that's also a good question. We're, we're looking at that right now, that type of thing, and actually, um, we're going to start, we're going to do a study, uh, two different studies. One we're going to do uh, using NMES uh, to prevent uh, disuse atrophy following um, ankle sprains where we use casting early in the, uh, in the treatment period and, we, and followed by a walking boot, but it's a similar application in a post-op. It's an excellent application in a post-op uh, Achilles tendon uh, especially in a dancer and especially in an athlete where we would, we would, we'd apply the uh, NMES electrodes again sterilely in the operating room. Our post-op protocol for Achilles tendon is generally we have them uh, in a short leg cast, non-wapering for at least the first two to three weeks and, we, and we're going to do a study going forward looking at that uh, in terms of preventing the disuse atrophy. So yes, I think that uh, there's this definitive application of NMES in post-op uh, Achilles tendon, uh, specifically kind of phase one, zero to two or three weeks when there's a mobilization preventing disuse atrophy, and actually putting the NMES on the, on the uh, gastroc even in the early post-injury period uh, prior to surgical intervention. And then going forward with similar, you know, using the um, ACL template uh, post-op uh, program for the Achilles, you can do a phase one, two, three, and just adjusting the times uh, and the and the length of the uh, of those intervals appropriately for the Achilles. But yes, I definitely uh, agree with utilization of NMES after Achilles tendon repair. Okay, I have another question for you, Dr. Fader. Joshua was asking, are the recommendations for NMES the same for hamstring grafts and allografts as for patellar tendon grafts? Yes. The only caveat to that is uh, probably just doing a little less uh, hamstring or a little less, less aggressive hamstring activation in the early post-operative period. Um, because you're taking the hamstring graft, but 98% of that post-op protocol is identical for both for allograft and uh, for a hamstring graft. Okay, another question for you, Dr. Fader. Gilbert is asking, regarding full extension during the rehab process in weeks two to five, I noticed that the patient didn't have an ACL brace on. Is there any concern over hyperextension causing the graft to become overlaxed? Uh, not really. We do, my protocol, even it may not have been in the pictures we showed, but my protocol is uh, generally they have a full, they have a long leg hinge brace for the first six weeks depending upon uh, quad uh, control and neuromuscular control and uh, the extent of, their, of being, them being able to maintain the full extension. Um, I have never seen, knock on wood, anybody really go into a hyperextension situation and injure the graft. Uh, the vast majority of patients, no matter how perfect the operative uh, procedure is, they'll have a little bit of uh, uh, flexion or extension, extension lag or, or a slight flexion contracture in the, in the first few days postoperatively, so we really uh, accentuate and emphasize quad sets uh, with the NMES, with a bolster under the ankle, with the knee hanging to accentuate uh, and restore the full extension. It's very, very, very rare that I've ever seen, or I may never have seen, uh, a hyperextended knee in that early post-op period. 
Okay, Dr. Fader, this question from Matt. When using NMES, how do you coordinate the timing of doing the exercise like the lunge, squat, or leg press so the muscle contraction from the NMES and the contraction from the exercise synchronize? Well, that's an incredibly good question because I personally do use NMES and I'm going to let Jim comment after I make my personal comment. Basically, you uh, uh, the way I a apply it and my understanding is the proper application is just to move through the um, if it's an eight an eight rep set you just move through that eight rep set uh, and you will get the synchronous uh, contraction the vast majority of your reps and then occasionally you won't but the vast majority will be synchronous with the NMES but Jim please give your comment on that Sure. Um, first off, when you look at the screen on these devices, it uh, there's a split screen when you get to the strengthening tetanic contraction phase of the program, and you can tell um, when the contraction is coming on and when it's going to let go. So there, it, it's a visual cue that you get with the machine. Um, secondly, I would say there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. So what Dr. Fader is talking about where he's actually exercising through the both the contraction and the relaxation phase um, from one repetition, then uh, that that's fine. That works well. If you want to time your contractions to uh, be synchronous with the machines and voluntary contractions, it's going to change the way your routine uh, is going to play out. So if you're looking to do four sets of eight or three sets of ten or, or whatever the case may be, um, I think you'd have to subscribe to Dr. Fader's approach to that. Uh, if you wanted to change it up and do, say, a rest-pause type of a routine where you're uh, you know, one of the things about NMES is you're going to get a really strong contraction. You're going to get a stronger contraction if you desire than you could with a one rep max intensity. Um, so if you're doing a couple of reps with a recruitment that's greater than what you'd get from lifting a high percent of your one rep max, you know, a rest pause kind of an approach would work fine. So basically, if you're doing the resistance program that Dr. Fader was talking about, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be eight seconds on, and you're going to have anywhere from four to seven seconds off, depending on uh, which level of program you choose. So um, I don't think that you would be able to get through an entire uh, program doing one exercise. Um, synchronously with that program because the work time is anywhere from 12 to 13 minutes on that program and uh, even more when you're training some of the other other muscle fiber types so it would just be you'd be a big overload um, but you have to kind of fool around with it but you can synchronize it because you do get visual cues from the device I agree Jim okay I think this is going to be our last question for today um, over to you Dr. Fader Anita's asking how does NMES work in the prevention of thrombosis? Well, honestly, I am not that familiar uh, with that, but just in general, the way to, the way to uh, prevent DVTs is really muscle contraction and venous return. So, <clears throat> um, you know, NMES obviously causes <clears throat> uh, very good muscle contraction on a passive in a passive fashion, as well as a <clears throat> in combination with uh, with uh, voluntary contraction. So, although I'm not familiar with any specific literature, um, my impression, clinical impression, would be utilizing NMES would decrease DVT uh, because of the uh, a passive muscle contraction early in the post-op period, increasing venous return. But uh, Jim, do you have any info on that? Yeah, I, well, I think if you were using it to prevent um, DVT, I think it would be a great device for that. I think yeah. if one already has it, 
then it's contraindicated. Right. I totally yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Yes, I think it would be uh, advantageous in prevention. And, and one thing that is, uh, is mandated in this day and age is actually uh, sequential compression uh, devices in, in, every, in every patient in the, uh, in the recovery room. So there's actually a, uh, a movement and a, and a requirement actually to uh, apply sequential compression stockings in post-op patients across the board to overall decrease DVT. And um, as I suggested earlier, with the muscle contraction, I think that increases the venous return once they go home and utilize the NMES and more than likely would significantly reduce the incidence of DVT. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, well, um, thank you both. And, and folks, we are uh, a little bit beyond that time, actually. want to thank each of you for joining us today. Hope you found today's webinar to be of value, that you'll want to join us for future events. A special thanks to our, our guests, Dr. Fader and Jim Bruskowitz, as well as uh, the sponsor, for today, DJO and the West Coast Sports Medicine Foundation. Again, this is your moderator, Lori Dearman, saying thank you and have a great rest of the week. Goodbye for now.